Thank you very much, Councillor Scott. Arima, good evening. Oh, Arima. Arima, you look beautiful tonight. It's so good to be home. Political leader of the People's National Movement and Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, who is listening live on I-95.5 FM and who is on his way here to this public meeting in Arima. Let's recognize our Prime Minister in his absence. The Honorable Penelope Beckles Robinson, Member of Parliament for Arima. The Honorable Foster Cummings, Member of Parliament for Lahokata Talparo. The Honorable Camille Robinson Regis, resident of Arima, but Member of Parliament for Aruka Maloney. Mrs. Joan Yule Williams, Deputy Political Leader of the People's National Movement. Miss Irene Hines, Operations Officer of the PNM, who celebrates 25 years in local government this year. Other officers of the movement, His Worship, the Mayor of the Royal Chartered Borough of Arima, Alderman Cagney Casimir. Ministers of Government, Members of Parliament, Senators, members of the Arima Borough Corporation and other local government practitioners. And I must especially say good evening to you, the beautiful people of Arima. And we say good evening as well to those viewing live on TTT and those viewing on our PNM Facebook page and YouTube channel and those listening on I-95.5 FM. We wish you were here, but we're happy that you have joined us. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a clear attempt to destabilize Trinidad and Tobago by those opposed to the People's National Movement. Ladies and gentlemen, at no time must we in the PNM take that lightly. The PNM, ladies and gentlemen, has always stood for truth, for honesty, and for integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, on PNM platforms, when we gather in our numbers, and thank God we have safely made it through COVID under the leadership of Dr. Rowley, on PNM platforms, when we gather, we tell you what our achievements are and what we intend to do. On a PNM platform, we will not call anybody satanic. I had the misfortune of hearing something over the weekend of some misfit calling our party satanic. Ladies and gentlemen, we must let them know that what is satanic is dragging a coffin across the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. And we in the PNM will not accept that, ladies and gentlemen. We also have a puppeteer behind the opposition leader. And the Express had to hit him one calpit and tell him, get down from that high horse, Quirky. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we in the PNM want to tell Quirky, come down from there, Quirky, and come down from there, Kamla. We're not playing that with you. The PNM is about justice, fairness, and the governance of this country and the treatment of all the people of Trinidad and Tobago. We must let Kamala Pasad Bisasa know that her self-aggrandizement and that her desperate efforts to politicize sensitive issues in this country will not be tolerated and the PNM will not play political football with her on those matters. And so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to connect people and we are happy to speak the truth to all of you here in Trinidad and Tobago. And we proceed with our meeting. Our first speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, holds a very special space in the hearts of our arima. Her first foray into electoral politics was in 1992. I campaigned with her as a primary school student when she successfully contested the neighboring electoral district of Arima Northeast. In 1995, she was appointed as an opposition senator 
From 2000 to 2010, she served as our MP here in Arima. She has previously served as a Trinidad and Tobago ambassador to the United Nations in New York. And we in Arima in 2020 re-elected her as our member of parliament. She currently serves as the Minister of Planning and Development and hers is a clear vision for transforming Arima into a smart city. Arima, would you please welcome our member of parliament, the Honorable Penelope Beckles Robinson. Friend Heinz, yeah, no worry. Smile with the rising sun. Really the bird. It's by my doorstep. Singing sweet song. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. But it's pure and true. As I acknowledge my colleagues at the head table, our lady vice chairman who selected the best place in Trinidad and Tobago to live. Hey. <laughs> and my, the Honorable Foster Cummins, of course his constituency is next to mine. He decided to select the constituency next to me, next best to Arima, Laoketa <laughs> Talparo. And of course, our chairman of this evening's proceedings, who's also from Arima. <laughs> right? Um, His Worship, the Mayor of Arima, Alderman Cagney Casimir, I know I saw him somewhere, and all other councillors from the Arima Borough Corporation, uh, our deputy political leader, and as the chairman indicated, our political leader is on his way, um, Dr. the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Um, he'll be here shortly. Let me specially acknowledge, and I'm sure... Uh, somewhere uh, uh, during this session, he'd be here and we'd be able to officially welcome him to the Royal Chartered Borough of Arima. Let me acknowledge in the audience uh, Chief Ricardo Barra Fernandez. <laughs> My cabinet colleagues, uh, senators, other chairmen of regional corporation, other mayors, members of the media, uh, viewers, online as well as on I-95 and let me of course specially acknowledge the people of Mount Pleasant Calvary and by extension the beautiful people of the constituency of Arima. Good evening. Tonight we are in a very special constituency and a very special town even if I say so myself Arima the borough Arima the constituency uh, some people don't know that Arima, of course, is bounded by constituencies of Laoketa, Talparo, Toko, Sandy Grandi, uh, St. Anne's East, Dabadi Omera, as well as Lupino Bonne. I see my colleague here from Lupino Bonne. So that when you think of Arima, a lot of people don't realize we start all the way in Las Cuevas, and we have those villages of La Follette, Blanchichez, Monlaca, Paria. We go all the way to my brother from Toco Sandy Grandi, almost all the way to Valencia, and we are bound on the south by Laoketa, um, and on the west, uh, the Mausica River. So I just want to make sure that we have a good understanding, which also includes the, uh, La, the heights of Aripo. Uh, and we are in Arima. This is the home of the First Peoples as well as the home of the Grand Master, Lord Kitchener. And if he was alive, he would have been served, he would have been 100 years today. And we have, of course, that landmark of the dial. And for the people of Brasoseco and Aripo, who are now going to many countries in Europe and are now known for the world, for, for the world-class chocolates that we produce in Arima. And could you celebrate Aripo and 
So tonight is indeed very special because we are here in this community center in Mount Pleasant, Calvary. And this is the first time that the People's National Movement is having a national meeting. And therefore, this is very special for the people of Mount Pleasant, Calvary. I want to say that tonight also marks one year, nine months, and 14 days since the people of the borough of Arima and the Arima constituency return the People's National Movement to government. Under, of course, the very distinguished, safe, stable, and capable leadership of the Honorable Dr. Keith Rowley. And of course, as, the, as Laurel said, welcome me back to Arima once again to serve the people of Arima, for which I'm eternally grateful. I want to make sure that tonight, for the time that I speak, I'm not going to waste too much time on a number of things that the UNC has been saying. I'll, I'll, I'll deal with a couple of things. But it is very important for us to recognize the amount of work that the People's National Movement has been doing. And sometimes we could get a little distracted, which we need to, eh? We need to deal with them, but we also need to let you know that the PNM has do, been doing a lot of work. Because if we don't do that, we can get carried away and fall into the trap of dealing with a lot of the foolishness that they have been saying against the People's National Movement. And they will take credit, for example, of the hospital, of the Arima Hospital, and very soon, the Minister of Health is going to recommission that Arima Hospital, that 200 million US investment. And the people of Arima will now have the use of that hospital because the decision was taken because of the pandemic. We had to use the hospital at the time. So in the next week or two, the, there would be the recommissioning of the hospital. And I want to ask you to put your hands together for the doctors and the nurses of the Arima Hospital. Late last year, the Honorable Shampa Kojo accompanied me to the Arima Community Center, and I see Dr. Bernard here, who has been one of those stalwarts, ensuring that the center is operational. And I'm sure you are extremely happy of, happy of that model excellence, that community center that was much needed, um, and it's now open. They would be appointed, a board would be appointed soon, and we will have the benefit of the, of the new spanking Arima Community Center. <laughs> now, I, I see a lot of people here from Calvary and Mount Pleasant, and it's my, of course, and it's, it is my responsibility to say to you that I know you have been experiencing some water issues within recent times, uh, Minister Gonzalez is here, but I want to say that it's important for me to report to you that to date WASA has completed five supply improvement projects in the Arima constituency with two ongoing. <laughs> so that you would be aware that we completed the construction and commissioning of the Arima booster to improve levels of service for the residents of Pinto and Santa Rosa the drilling and commissioning of the Aripo well to provide additional water supply along the Hollis tram transmission system that benefits part of the town of Arima, the drilling and commissioning of the Beckles Lane well to provide 24-7 service and additional water supply to customers, and that is around the old Arima Road, the installation of a four-inch pipeline in Brasso Seco to provide a first-time supply to 20 households on a 24-7 basis, and the construction of an intake and installation of a 0.7 kilometer of distribution line in Lalaha to benefit households, and they would be having water and in that area for the first time. As it relates to the ongoing projects, the one that is most important to our communities here in Mount Pleasant and Calvary is the Arima Well 15. This is the drilling and commissioning of a well to be utilized to improve the level of service to the customers in Mount Pleasant, Calvary, Tannis Lane, and Watley Circular. It is expected to be completed in mid-June and expected to improve at least the service 
to at least four days a week. Let us thank and congratulate the Minister. Ongoing work by WASA is the Aripo Well P2, which will provide additional water supply to the town of Arima, and that will also be completed in June 2022. There are also some upcoming projects, the development of a first-time supply to residents of the First People community, Arima Blanchichez Road. This project, yes, Ricardo, good. This project will commence June 2022 to provide a 24-3 level of service and additionally the upgrade of the Guanato, Guanapo water treatment will increase the production and transmission capacity to increase levels of service to customers in Machuita, Calvary and the town of Arima. Oh. I know that for Councillor Scott this has been one of her major concerns as well as uh, persons in the business community of Arima and I know Councillor Scott will be much more happy and I want to say therefore to the residents of Calvary, Mount Pleasant and environs that your council and your MP has been working in your interest. <laughs> now, I want to use the opportunity to express condolences to the family of Steve Quintero who died just a couple days ago when he got a bad drive and ended up in one of the precipices on the Blanchichez Road. Um, for the people of Arima, uh, the Quintero family, they are a very popular family. They are very well known. Mr. Quintero was well known in Arima. Um, and we really, on behalf of the Prime Minister and all my cabinet colleagues and the entire Arima, we want to express condolences to them. And we understand that some people had to say that, of course, is the government didn't fix the road. You know, somebody gave a bad drive, and is the government gave the bad drive. But the point about it is, a life has been lost, and for us, that is our concern. Um, I want to share with the residents who have been concerned about that road, the Blanchichez Road, that the Ministry of Works will be commencing some works. It's, a, it's in an extremely bad condition. Nobody is happy about that. Um, my colleague here too as well from Toko Sandy Grandi. You know, we are sister constituencies and there are similar roads in Matlot and other places. I just want you to know that the government is committed. The tenders have been out for at least two packages in relation to Arima Blanchichez. Um, I had office day recently in, um, in Blanchichez and they have started doing some milling and they have started to do, do some work there and the residents I know you have been extremely patient and we want to ask you to continue to work with us um, and I give you the assurance that the, rep the appropriate representation has been made to ensure that those roads are repaired. Everything is not going to be done right away um, and I see Councillor uh, Moore is here, Roger Moore is here from that area. Um, I also want to talk to the people of our repo tonight who have been expressing concerns as well that that is also on the agenda of the Ministry of Works to do works there together with my recent visit um, at the Mount Pleasant Road where there is some erosion. The Ministry of Works also visit there recently, recently. So let me also ask you to acknowledge the work of the Ministry of Works and uh, say to the constituency of Arima that you will see some considerable improvements in the next two years. Thank you very much. Um, now, you would recall that I think it was just about a week ago that the Honorable Foster Cummings and myself, we were in Wallafield at Solomon Temple doing what is a very, very important exercise for the farmers in the Wallafield area. That's a special area for us because, as you know, that is where Eric Williams, that was one of the major areas that he started farming, that Wallafield area. Now, we understand, as I said, we are sister constituencies, and we decided to do a project together for the benefit of the farmers. We also had the benefit of the Minister of Lands, uh, the Honorable Senator DeFreitas, and I also spoke with the Minister of Agriculture, who is here with us. Um, and they both not only gave their support, um, Senator DeFreitas was actually present. Um, and what is so unfortunate is that it was last week at the Monday Night Forum. 
you would recall that the leader of the opposition decided to, to put up on the screen a flyer. And in that flyer, she indicated that Minister Cummins and myself were going to have a session on how to grab land and get away with it. Now, that is how low someone can steep. That low, how someone can stoop. That low, ridiculous, in order to try to discredit what was an extremely serious exercise. Now, in Wallafield, the farmers are concerned with the cost of surveying. They are concerned with the issue of their leases not being renewed for several years. They are concerned about water supply. They are concerned about issues of connectivity. You know, they are concerned about grants because of what has happened during COVID. And yet still, her focus is to try to discredit the both of us and make the population believe that we are bringing farmers in to land grab. We must not take these things very lightly because there are people who actually believe that that is what this session was about. And I want to say to you that our commitment is to the farmers of Arima, Wallafield, Blanche Shares. And, um, and that's why I say we are not going to get distracted. We want to, we, we visited that area um, and we know that is one of the breadbasket people there, whether it's, and, and the issue of Pradia Larceny, that's an important issue because there are a number of farmers in going to the Ministry of Agriculture to have their, their leases renewed. One of their challenges is some of them are so frustrated by persons stealing their cows, you know, stealing, you know, their pigs. It has been an extreme challenge for them, and therefore some of them don't even want to get in to dealing with animals because they're absolutely fed up. And it is our responsibilities as mem members of parliament to go to our colleagues and to see what we can do so to ensure that these farmers are committed so that we can deal with the issue of food security. We understand that a lot of children just don't want to get into farming. Their parents are telling you that they don't have any members of their family who want to farm. Now, if we have that issue, how are we going to deal with food security? And that is what the Honorable Foster Cummings and myself um, was addressing. I want to, to use the opportunity in the few minutes that I have to to thank the Honorable Prime Minister for giving me the opportunity to serve again after 10 years as a member of parliament and as a minister of government and to serve in his cabinet. The, the, uh, my constituents would have realized that one of the decisions of the parliament and of the government was to give members of parliament additional offices so that there is an office in Santa Rosa and there is an office in Blanche Shares. And I, I, I want to let you know that I continue to have roving office days so that I see my constituents, whether it's in Machuita, whether it's in Pinto, whether it is in Demerara Road, it matters not. The important thing is service. And I want to make it abundantly clear that members of parliament, councillors, mayors, chairmen, the People's National Movement has always had as its mantra, service to the people, service to the people. And therefore, when the mayor and I meet, or the councillors meet, and we have Councillor Rondon here from Sandy Grandi, who can probably write maybe four or five chapters of the importance of serving as a councillor. It was just yesterday that we passed the local government bill. And I know I want to... And I want to congratulate the, the uh, leader of government business in the house together with all of my colleagues. Um, as a former, as a former councillor myself, I have had the opportunity to start my political career as a councillor. And it is special to me to have sat in the parliament yesterday and vote yes for local government reform. Thank you very much.
and gentlemen, is how you report to your constituents and to the nation. That is PNM delivering good governance in Arima and good governance to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Permit me please to recognize two of our deputy political leaders, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines and Senator the Honorable Rohan Sinanon, who have joined us here in Arima. And so we move on, ladies and gentlemen. Young, dynamic, energetic, and unshakable. Our next speaker has been a faithful member of the PNM for almost 30 years. <laughs> When he playing young, do study him. <laughs> he has served at every level of the party, from the youth league to constituency executive to national executive, and he currently occupies the seat of general secretary of the People's National Movement. In 2015, he was appointed as a government senator, and in 2020, he resoundingly won the Lahoketa Talparo seat on behalf of the People's National Movement. <laughs> He also holds the portfolio of Minister of Youth Development and National Service. And from that seat, he is the driver of a number of critical initiatives designed to make positive interventions in the lives of our nation's youth, something that the opposition is very much opposed to because they don't care about you and they don't care about the young people. And so here tonight to report to you, on his work in his ministry as the Minister of Youth Development and National Service, please welcome the Honorable Foster Cummings. They can't keep a good man down, always keep a smile when they want me to frown. Keep the vibes and I stood my ground, they will never ever take my crown. Oh, damn bless, I say no man hurts. Things getting better when they thought it would be worse. Here comes the officers asking for a search. They found no weapon, just only a draw first. But I'm so sad it does a rock, they just can't stop me now. Even when they set their traps, they just can't stop me now. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM. And we shall prevail. To our esteemed political leader and prime minister, who is on his way and will join us shortly, the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Our Lady Vice Chairman and Member of Parliament for Aruka Maloney, the Honorable Camille Robinson Regis. Our Member of Parliament for RIMA and Minister of Planning and Development, the Honorable Penelope Beckles. Our Child of the PNM, Senator Laurel Lizama Leasing. Our various deputy political leaders who are here, Honorable Joan U. Williams and Honorable Fitzgerald Hines, and all my cabinet colleagues, ministers of government, officers of the movement, officers of the executive of Arima, his worship, the mayor of Arima, and all councillors and members of the Arima Borough Council. Welcome to the PNM meeting. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, residents of Arima, and citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, it's a very important time in this country when people seem to have forgotten the sins of the UNC and the sins of the partnership and the sins of Alibaba and the 40 thieves who more than them could thief but you know they come Monday after Monday and they want to call everybody thief I want to remind Trinidad and Tobago that it was during 2010 to 2015 that for the first time we saw a siphon plugged into the treasury and these people raped the treasury consistently for five years plus and now they want to come back you will have the opportunity in the next three years to decide whether you will go with the stable PNM or whether you return to the mayhem of the UNC and so 
I draw your focus and your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, let us please stand and welcome the political leader of the People's National Movement, the member of Parliament for Liberal Martin. A man who we support tremendously to lead our great party and to continue to lead Trinidad and Tobago for as long as he is willing to. <laughs> I didn't hear you. To continue to lead this great party and to continue to lead Trinidad and Tobago. Because if ever a time we needed a strong leader, this is such a time. It took a leader with vision and a leader with courage and a leader committed and determined to guide our young people to establish a ministry called the Ministry of Youth Development and National Service. For the first time in our history, we had a youth ministry and a ministry specifically dedicated to the development of our young people. For that, we say thank you. And of course, my good friend and colleague started the innings, the Honorable Fitzgerald Hines. And when he went on to other things, I was asked to continue the work that he started. Very soon, we will take legislation to the Parliament for the establishment of a youth development agency in Trinidad and Tobago, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Leading the way in the English-speaking Caribbean as we revolutionize the approach to youth development, as we take careful note of the programs required and necessary for the development of our young people, as we put in place the structures and facilities and a new management model for our various youth programs and our youth development centers. This agency in Trinidad and Tobago, we go to the parliament, cabinet has approved the establishment of a national youth development agency. <laughs> Young people, we have your back. We have your back. I would have indicated to you before that work has already started on the refurbishment of the Presto Presto Youth Camp and on the Chatham Youth Camp in Point 14. We aim to provide safe spaces where our young people who require certain skill sets in terms of vocational training and other sorts and other programs to get into a residential setting at these various camps, Presto Presto, Chatham, we will as well establish the Eldorado Camp for Girls. You would be pleased to know that here in the East Trinidad in Wallafield, the government will construct a new youth camp for both male and female in Wallafield. And those in the West, you are not forgotten at all. Because very soon a contract will be awarded for the refurbishment of the Shagaramas Convention Center and the repurpose of, to repurpose that facility as a youth camp for our young people in West Trinidad. <laughs> Added to that facility will be 50 acres of agricultural land in the West in Shagaramas for the agricultural component of our facility in West Trinidad, so that all our young people who are interested in agriculture, no matter where you are, 
whether you are in the west, in the east, in the north, in the south, in central Trinidad, in Tobago, wherever you are, you will have access to vocational training in a residential or non-residential facility. <laughs> Work has already started on the St. Michael Home for Boys in Digo Martin. And at that facility, ladies and gentlemen, you know that that facility will be focused on providing vocational training for wards of the states, otherwise known as CHINs, children under the supervision of the state, and it's designed for our young men, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Work has been completed. I'm not telling you about things that we're just talking about, you know. This is an action-packed government, you know. We are about delivering services to all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Work, and we will not be distracted. We will not be distracted by old talk. We will, we will focus on the truth and the work that the people have elected us to do. <laughs> work has already started, work has been completed, sorry, on the Josephine Shaw Transition Home in Port of Spain, and this facility is for young women. <laughs> Very soon, we will commission that facility for the use of our young women transitioning out of residential uh, living, the, the community homes, and that two-year transition period will allow them to transition into what you would call regular life. We will upgrade and expand the tra transition home for boys at St. Madeline to increase the intake because we recognize that the need exists. In Coover, at the Sevilla compound, we will establish a transition home for young ladies there as well. And at the beach camp facility in Palo Seco, a, another transition home for our young men. We are making sure that we take care of the future of our nation, ladies and gentlemen of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Cabinet has appointed a National Service Advisory Committee headed by Dr. Ruby Allen, and that committee will soon complete its work and submit its report to the Cabinet. In the meantime, we will soon start work on the Mousy, Old Mausica Teachers Training College that currently houses the MyLAT program, the MyPath program, and the CCC program. Our intention is to increase the intake, to double the intake in terms of the MyLAT and the MyPath program and increase the facility for the CCC program, a program that recently celebrated 20 years. And that program has made a significant impact on the lives of our young people. The government has approved the use of the beach camp facility in Palo Seco as a new national service complex that will accommodate over 1,000 cadets, ladies and gentlemen. What we are doing is that throughout the island of Trinidad, and indeed we have started discussions with our friends in Tobago as well, but throughout Trinidad and Tobago, we will have facilities available for training for our young people. You don't see that making the front page. But that is news that should be making the front page. That is news that the media should be carrying so that our young people can see that they have the training opportunities and that there's an emphasis on entrepreneurship that you can pursue after you acquire your skills. Right here in Malabar, the Prime Minister recently, on learning of the talent that exists in that area, gave instructions to pay attention to the young men from the Malabar Young Stars Football Club. You familiar with that organization? Yeah. It is at Gardenia and Croton Lane. Yeah. And it was founded by a Mr. Clint Bushby. Busby. And produced players such as Isaiah Lee, Ronaldo, Francois, and Keshawn Hackshaw, players who have played on the national and international scale for Trinidad and Tobago. And we have a prime minister who is very alert to social media. 
So he noticed what is taking place there and he said, we are going to do something in Malabar to develop a facility for these young men. And already discussions have started between the Ministry of Youth Development and the Ministry of Housing to construct a facility in Malabar for the benefits of the young people in that community. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I see some excitement taking place in the crowd there. Like we have some people from Malabar in the house. We are very, are those councillors in the area there? Oh, oh. <laughs> councillors from Malabar. That's some good news for you. A gift from your Prime Minister. We are very concerned about food security. And I have visited already our new Minister of Agriculture and his team. They are all present here. Give them a round of applause. They hit the road running and we are working together because we want to make sure the young people, those who are interested, every single one of them, have an opportunity to train and practice agriculture in Trinidad and Tobago. And then I could tell you about the YAP program. Well, I see certain people getting very excited about the YAP program even more than the PNM. <laughs> it is a program that is designed to offer one-year training, a certificate training in agriculture at ECIAF for those young persons who have applied and been successful. Following that one year, we will move them onto the lands for another one year of practical training. You'll be pleased to know, ladies and gentlemen, that the government has decided to use some of the idle state lands, former Petrochin lands, other state lands, I wouldn't say county lands because I might get another letter, <laughs> but lands that are available and belong to the citizens, all of the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> we will put in the infrastructure, that is to say access roads and water and lights, etc. It is a homestead development and upon successful completion of that two-year program, you must demonstrate that you have a keen interest and you have successfully completed the program, you will then gain access to those lands to establish your homestead farm. You will receive technical services from the Ministry of Agriculture. As a matter of fact, the program is so designed to create successes that even the initial brush cutting, rotavating, and plowing services will be provided by the state. The first cohort is some 200 young people that were drawn from throughout the country, from throughout the national community. We will establish these estates in point 14. I heard somebody saying, that all of these estates only go in, in their constituencies where they control and is their constituency and their constituency. This is the government of Trinidad and Tobago. So it is where the lands are available. If you have land in Belmont, tell me and I will talk to the Prime Minister and we'll establish homestead there. But Heinz, if you have land in your constituency, we will establish homestead there. But when we look at the available lands, there are lands in Point Fortin, in Labre, in Faisabad, in Valencia, in Talparo, in Todd Road, in Santa Cruz, and Gran Rucova, and that is where the homesteads will be established. For all the citizens, I today received a legal letter about homestead. And we will reply in due course, but it will not deter us from doing the work that we were elected to do. Because what they expect is as they attack our policy, we saw the PNM, founded by Rick Williams, continued by George Chambers, 33, back into government by 
Patrick Manning, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley, we saw in the PNM so afraid them that we will abandon the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. That will not happen. That and a pink donkey around Woodford Square, they will not see. They could talk and they could talk and we will work and we will work for the benefit of all the citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, ladies and gentlemen. So in winding up, I must tell you that we have the MILAT program, extremely successful, run by the Ministry of Youth and the military. And the successes we have been seeing in that program, young men 16 to 20 years old, came in with zero levels, leaving with six and seven. So what as a responsible government do you think we will do? We will expand it so that we have more successes. We will include the young women in this program because it has been so successful and it is working for young people. The Retiree Adolescent Partnership Program, a program where we have the senior citizens joining with the children from the post, not the post primary, the, the, the common, not common entrance, what is it again? SEA class to assist them, to assist them in their homework and preparation for the examination, we will continue that program. The Amplify program that we will launch this Friday at NESC, that program is designed, started, that work was started by my colleague. We now want to put it on stream, Brother Hines, in skilled music producers and arrangers. The All Set program that we launched last week a heavy equipment program to train our young people in the operation of heavy equipment, excavator, barco, skid, steer, forklift, as we prepare them for the place of work. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we will continue these development programs. There's so much for me to tell you, but tonight my time is limited. So I will continue to speak to you through other forum to explain to you the work that the government is doing for the young people of Trinidad and Tobago. Our non-residential centers to be established throughout the island. We are going to be coming to you. We are going to be establishing these non-residential centers. One is to be established, established in Toko Sandy Grandi. We are to establish and expand the one at Laventil. We will be coming to, to several areas of the country. South Trinidad, Central Trinidad, because what we are doing is we are taking the training to you. And tonight, I want to tell you that if you're serious about the development of Trinidad and Tobago, don't be distracted by the old talk, you know. Place your confidence in the PNM, because the PNM has worked for you. Place your confidence in this Prime Minister, the Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. And this cabinet of serious men and women. We're not about Bacchanal and Kankata. We're about the development of this country. So that we will all be able to say, Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM. Great is the PNM. And we shall prevail. Thank you, ladies and Malabar councillors dancing and partying at such great news courtesy the People's National Movement. Trinidad and Tobago, Arima, the young people never had it so good in this country. Youth camps across the country, vocational training for all, excavator driving skills. And Minister, I want to let you know that there are people in this hall who are over the age of 35, Alderman Piper, who want to learn how to drive excavators. <laughs> 
but I received that message from her, so I'm just delivering the message, but it's a wonderful program. And let's hear it for our very hardworking Minister of Youth Development and National Service. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so delighted to present our next speaker. Known for her sharp wit and her erudite debating skills, Camille Robinson Regis is indisputably a political powerhouse in Trinidad and Tobago. She leads the PNM's Women's League with finesse, with passion, and with integrity. Similarly, she leads the government bench in the House of Representatives with vigor, with decency, and with a determination to uphold the Constitution and the law in the interest of all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. She, ladies and gentlemen, is the Minister of Housing and Development, and since 2015, she has served as the Member of Parliament for the constituency of Aruka Maloney. <laughs> Just yesterday, she led the conclusion of the debate on the Joint Select Committee's report, which led to the, which led to the, uh, the miscellaneous provision local government bill being read a third time and passed in the House of Representatives. And that bill, ladies and gentlemen, it moves to the Senate in, in a due course, but that bill is so critical to so many of our councillors here today and so many to all the people of Trinidad as it ensures that there is a better delivery of service for all of these things. I'm not giving you a speech, madam, sorry. And better conditions for local government practitioners. Irene celebrates 25 years of service today. Councillor Rondon celebrates 28 years of service in two weeks, ladies and gentlemen. And that is what she is doing for our local government practitioners. And so, Arima, would you please welcome our women's warrior, the Honorable Camille Robinson Regis. Hello, 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 hello. Ooh, hello, 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 hello. She from my don't know. She wears some gold. The place like a dojo. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. Political leader of the People's National Movement. The good book admonishes us to honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land of the living. But there comes a time when we have to tell the elders that their behavior is not worthy of emulation. There comes a time when we have to tell the elders, and particularly those who have served this country, in whatever capacity that the road that you are traveling could lead to your perdition. There comes a time when we have to tell our elders, as the young soccer artists reminded us earlier this year, come down from day. There comes a time when we have to call out Kamla, Sushila, Pasad, Bicesa for, for the cowardly, deceptive, dishonest, disingenuous individual that she takes revel and takes time in being, and that time is now. <laughs> Kamla Sushila Pasad Bisesa. I don't care if I am WPC, but I am also L-O-T-H. I am also L-V-C. And I am also here to tell you, come down from day tonight. 
We have to do that, ladies and gentlemen, because she is trying to rewrite history. They are attempting to construct their own truth. They are engaging in all manner of semantics to absolve themselves from blame. But I am saying that they are only digging deeper holes for themselves. You, Kamla Sushila Prasad Bisesa, you are the leader and ringleader of a party that would lie, steal, and do anything unholy for political power. And you mean to tell us in Trinidad and Tobago, we know you, that you have all this sordid information about the PNM and its membership, and you're not using it against us? You have all this information about us being pedophiles, and you not using it against us? Come, let's stop talking horse manure. <laughs> Kamla, you tried through Vanilla Allen Topping to accuse our beloved Prime Minister and his father of disgusting acts. Your party tried to accuse Mr. Manning of having a child whilst he was married, even going so far as to purchase plane tickets for this so-called mother and child. All lies. Kamala, we have not forgotten you or your party, and we know that you would go to any length to try to destroy the PNM, but better than you have tried that and the PNM is still here after 66 years. <laughs> Deceptive Kamala, we in the PNM value life. Can you and your husband say the same? Do you value children's lives no matter their age? Kamla, Manohar Ramsaran, and Robert Sabga, you all sat down on that report of abuse in children's homes and said nothing. Once an issue does not serve the narrative of the UNC and Kamla, they lie, they malign, they deceive, they deflect because that is what they are about to achieve their objectives. They keep deflecting, ladies and gentlemen, asking why the PNM are studying the 1997 Sabga report and questioning and not questioning the Judith Jones report. They have their agents in social media blatantly lying and using the deaths of children to gain cheap political points. They are using the names of the dead to tarnish, to malign, just so that they can deflect. But Kamala, not only the PNM, but the people of Trinidad and Tobago are seeing through your technique. It is not working. Deceptive Kamala Sushila Pasad Bisesta, you making a host of allegations against our party, which was founded on the principles of ethics, morality, respect, honesty, which is led by a man who lives his life in accordance with the principles of ethics, morality, respect, and honesty. We belong to a party with a long history of doing right for all the people of Trinidad and Tobago, from cradle to grave. We deny any knowledge of any heinous behavior. Instead of you just talking utter rubbish, why you don't bring the evidence? If you knew that 
we are engaged in heinous acts. Why you don't take the evidence to the police? You just want to talk nonsense. And so tonight I want to tell you and Robert Sabga, who are elders in our community, come down from there, sit down and hush. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, every time Robert Sabga opens his mouth to the media, he only succeeds in burying himself further. And I am almost certain that every other member of the Sabga family is hanging their head in shame. His accusations against the PNM have become so ridiculous that even the venerable Diana Mahabia Wyatt, a woman who has done so much to advance the cause of children and victims of domestic abuse, has had to publicly challenge his statements and wondered whether he remembered there were others on the task force and said that what he was spewing was never brought to the attention of the other members. The only thing she didn't do was tell him to shut up. The 1997 Sabga report was submitted in 1997, the same year that Sabga was given instruments of appointment for ambassador to Canada. Was this his reward? Did you forsake the children crying out for help to expedite your career, to expedite your dreams, and now 25 years later, you are expressing outrage over a report you sat on? If we look at the list of persons who have joined SABGA, is Kamla, then we have the Prince of Princess Tong, Barry Padarat, who continues his job of tugging at Kamla's dress tail. Barry shouting from the rooftop that the Sabga report was laid in Parliament and that the PNM had access to the report. And ladies and gentlemen, when the pixie dust and the MAC powder dried, <laughs> the Parliament quite rightly stated that no such report was ever laid. The Parliament said that no such report was ever laid. I am woman enough to tell Barry tonight it's time to put down Kamala handbag. <laughs> Let me make it abundantly clear to all of us gathered here, those listening on the World Wide Web, and to the national community, Barry Padarat, Manohar Ramsaran, misled the people of Trinidad and Tobago, and Kamla also misled the people of Trinidad and Tobago. The report was never laid in the parliament. But then again, being dishonest is the DNA of the UNC. And I posit that they hid the report. And then you all must remember David Naked jumping up and he talking too. He vexed with the Judith Jones Committee for not including his name in their report as someone who provided information. The same David Naked who said, the UNC cannot lead itself out of a paper bag. He's now a frontline speaker for the UNC. This is the same David Naked who admitted that at the request of Geraldine John and Kamla, he withheld information that could have helped in saving the lives of two of the five boys who absconded from the safe house operated by the Children's Authority. You all remember that? And then we have another supporter of this sordid situation, a certain 
CNN reporter, UNC agent, Masseuse, who goes by the name of Evie George. And I have one question for her. Who is the sitting High Court judge you have been contacting to get false information and use that on UNC propaganda sites? Tell us, please, frankly speaking, is this the same Evie George who has an odd relationship with a former high-ranking official and is, is now claiming that the PNM is responsible for pedophilia? At least she didn't blame us when the man teethed back his phone. But ladies and gentlemen, what are the facts? What are the facts? Because all of them talk in nonsense. The cabinet of 1997, led by then Prime Minister Bastio Pande, appointed a committee chaired by Robert Sabga to investigate allegations of abuse and neglect at children's homes in Trinidad and Tobago. The cabinet at that time is quite instructive. And with the permission of the cabinet or the, the prime minister, I have some of the cabinet notes here. And you all know that cabinet information is secret. But I do have information that I will share with you. The composition of the cabinet at the time is instructive. The cabinet listing for the period 1997 to 2000 includes the names of Kamla Sushila Prasad B. Sessa as the Minister of Legal Affairs, Wade Mark as the Minister of Public Administration and Information, Ralph Maraj as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ramesh Lawrence Maraj as the Attorney General, Brigadier Joseph Theodore as the Minister of National Security. And the Cabinet decision that was taken after the report came to the Cabinet said, the contents and I'm quoting, the contents of the report of the task force appointed to review the operations of children's homes and institutions in Trinidad and Tobago were made available to the cabinet. That investigations, and it was agreed that um, investigations by the task force have revealed that approximately 27 children's homes of varying sizes were known to be operating in Trinidad and Tobago, of which 10 were visited by the task force, and recommendations in respect thereof were set out in the executive summary of the report. The recommendations of the task force, and I'm paraphrasing, were that there should be licensing of homes, inspection of homes, investigations into the subventions, the development of a child care plan. There should be an examination by the Statutory Authority Service Commission, recommendations that address legal issues, management and staff recommendations, and recommendations to include a future task force. It also said that the comments of the Attorney General and the Minister of National Security on the legal issues raised in the report should be examined. It also said Cabinet referred for the consideration of the Minister of Public Administration and Information, Wade Mark, 
the recommendation of the Minister of Social Development that the statutory authority service commission terminate the services of certain members of staff. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing, nothing was done. Today, I asked the cabinet secretariat to check whether there was any subsequent information that came to the cabinet in regard to these recommendations. They could find nothing, nothing. They did absolutely nothing. The tears of every child that has been spilled since that report is on the hands of that cabinet who did nothing, absolutely nothing to protect them. But ladies and gentlemen, as soon as we came into office in 2001, we immediately set about making sure that the legislation, you would remember that Kamala talked about them passing five pieces of legislation. The five pieces of legislation were not workable. They did nothing with regard to the regulations. They did nothing with regard to training of staff. They did absolutely nothing to make the legislation implementable. It was only when the PNM came into office that we ensured that we did training, we made the legislation implementable. So they could talk about legislation being on the books, which it was, but we had to make so many amendments. We had to make regulations. We had to do everything to make the legislation implementable. And even when we did that, their former Attorney General, Anand Ram Logan, went to court because he recognized that there was a lacuna in the legislation and took the government to court to benefit from that, that space, which is what a lacuna is, or in the legislation which would allow him to win a case against the government. And they want to say that they love this country and they love children. I am telling you that no member of the PNM in opposition at the time received a copy of the report. We didn't have it. We had no access to it. And the only way we knew about it was because they made passing reference. And I repeat, passing reference to this report. And so when Kamala is trying to accuse our Prime Minister of having knowledge of the report, we say, Bolda Dash Kamla Pasad Bisesa, you had knowledge. You saw the report in the cabinet and you sat there and did absolutely nothing. And you want to call yourself mother of the nation. Let me tell you all something. Do you think if it was true that a PNM member was a pedophile, or if it was my fifth cousin on my great great grandmother's side who was a pedophile, or who had buried the report that Kamala and them were not going to be talking about that every single day? Exactly, they ought to be washing them out on us. 25 years after the, that report was completed, the UNC now taking basket from Rob, Robert Sabga. Imagine in one of his many interviews, Robert Sabga said he delivered the reports to Manohar Ramsaran in the dead of night. He moved 40 copies of the report from his car trunk to Manohar car trunk. What kind of cloak and dagger stuff they were up to? 
even um, Mrs. Mahabia Wyatt had to say that that's Watergate behavior. And why was it necessary to deliver a cabinet appointed committee report in the dead of night in a parking lot? They're making up a story. And then Robert Sabga linking the report to Akil Chambers tragic death. Akil Chambers died in 1998. God rest his soul. And he's saying PNM people responsible. Ladies and gentlemen, what did PNM do Robert Sabga so that he prepared to sacrifice all his credibility if he has any and all his integrity if he has any to drag us into UNC Kankatang. We in the PNM demand justice for Akil and every child that was harmed by evil. And that is why our Prime Minister on learning of the Sabga report has immediately asked for the police to get hold of the report and deal with the issues in that report. Our Prime Minister is the first person to say, get hold of the report and deal with the issues in that report. And it has been done. And they, inv they say now that they gave the report to Hilton Guy. But you all know this is, is only dead people they're talking about. Kamla and the UNC like Kobo. They're only looking for dead. What kind of, what is going on with them? Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you tonight, if that were the PNM, do you think we would sit on such a report? We commissioned the Judith Jones report. And as soon as the Children's Authority had had sight of it, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet insisted that it be laid in the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago, and it was done. The Prime Minister has also said, if there is any malfeasance, the police must deal with it, and that is being done. The truth is, ladies and gentlemen, that Kamla is always and has always been obsessed with the PNM, and I dare say she is obsessed with our political leader. But Kamla, you have plenty of us to go through before you can get to our political leader. Imagine Kamala talking about pedophilia and a pedophile ring when we understand that when we were amending the Marriage Act, Kamala swore in two pundits in the Senate to protest the abolition of child marriages. Kamala, we're not forgetting you. We remember all of that. And Between 1996 and 2016, the Registrar General recorded 3,478 child marriages. Based on the marriage certificates shown, girls as young as 11 and 12 were married to men as old as 42 and 56. And cowardly Kamala, Sushila, Pasad, Pisesa, always crying that she is a mother, a grandmother, a sister, a daughter, and she was supporting that. Kamala, you really expect us to believe that you care about children when 
You did nothing about the Sabka report. Don't try to implicate the PNM because the PNM has done everything in its power to make sure that the children's homes run properly, that people are trained, that the legislation is effective. You are accusing us of such disgusting and distasteful acts. And we understand you know a whole lot about human trafficking and prostitution and have done nothing about it. Imagine you have a young lady now in Parliament who just have to hear Fitzgerald Hines use the word skimpy, bare, naked, or even the word truth, and she automatically feel Fitz talking about her. <laughs> we belong to a party with a long and distinguished history of doing right by the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And it crawls my blood and the blood of all of us here when we hear you talk about our party like that. Instead of you just talking such disgusting rubbish, I say to you again, bring the evidence. Bring the evidence. Tonight, as I close, I want to ask Kamla Sushila Pasad Bisesa the following. What is your relationship with Evie George? Do you know Evie George? Does Evie George work for you? Are you aware that on September 21st, 2015, Evie George made a report to the Valencia police station at 3 p.m. and reported threats to have her killed by persons known and affiliated with the UNC hierarchy. And you all feel I am WPC and joke. <laughs> I have it here. <laughs> and after I finish with Kamla, I want a, um, a promotion, eh? <laughs> when Evie George told you about these threats, what did you do, Kamla? Ladies and gentlemen of the PNM, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, the UNC, as my colleague, the Member of Parliament for La Hoqueta Talparo has said, has declared war on the PNM and war on our political leader. Kamala's next step, I bet you, is to join with the unions and try to rally them against the government as public sector wage negotiations take place. Already, James Lambert, a former UNC senator, is calling for a shutdown of the country. Kamala, your desperation is showing. You are trying to cling to the last vestiges of control and power in the UNC. And therefore, we expect to see more brazen attacks against the PNM. So we know you have gotten tired of calling Faris's name. So now you're calling Foster's name. Kamala, we want to tell you, we want you to stay in charge. We want you to stay more than the opposition bench wants you to stay. Because once you there, the PNM there forever. <laughs> the only thing we want to ensure is that you don't drag us in the muck that you wallow in. And ladies and gentlemen of the PNM, there can be only one re response. We will fight fire with fire. We will face them toe to toe. We will defend our political leader in the morning, noon, and night. And in the end, we know that we will be victorious because
Great SDPNM. Great SDPNM. Great SDPNM. And we shall prevail. Thank you. Hello. gentlemen woo! those are the irrefutable and undisputable facts ladies and gentlemen those are the facts as identified by our party's lady vice chairman and so we know that nothing that comes out of the mouth of Kamala Prasad Bissessa is to be taken Kamala Shu Kamala Shu Kamala Shu Kamala Shu. Nothing coming out of Kamala Shu is to be taken as truth or as fact. And her notorious misdeeds and deception will ensure that she never traverses the corridor of power in Trinidad and Tobago again. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please briefly permit me to recognize the minority leader of the Tobago House of Assembly, Assemblyman Kelvin Morris. Our minority councillor, Councillor Petal Daniel Benoit. Our Tobago Senator, Senator Lawrence Hislop. Tobago in the house tonight. And since we are home, it's so nice to see our former Vice Chairman and Minister of Public Utilities, Robert Lahant. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the climax, well, we thought, but we reached the climax of the meeting, ladies and gentlemen. And so I have a few questions for you, and I want you to give me the answer. Who has taken us safely through an unprecedented pandemic? Who has managed our country through great economic challenges? Who has done the most with the least? Who is determined to ensure that food security is a priority for Trinidad and Tobago? Who has prioritized young people in Trinidad and Tobago? Who genuinely cares for the children of Trinidad and Tobago? Who is the driver of Vision 2030? Who is our leader phenomenal? And who is the right leader at the right time? Arima, Trinidad and Tobago, would you please welcome the political leader of the People's National Movement, the Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Member of Parliament for Diego Martin West, and the best leader for this country, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. Thank you very much, Calvary, famous name, Ariba, famous name. Thank you very much, Laurel. Permit me tonight to acknowledge on the stage with me my cabinet colleague, member of parliament,
Yeah, you know? Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are in Calvary, Narima, and I'm very pleased to be here, and I was just about to acknowledge my cabinet colleagues, the Member of Parliament, Farouk Maloney, Minister of Housing, yeah. Member of Parliament for Arima, Minister of Planning and Development, Member of Parliament for Lawrence Paro, Minister of Youth Development, and of course, your very own Senator. And of course, I once again would like to welcome to our PNM meeting, as we always do, the Venerable Deputy Political Leader or Matriarch, Mr. Joe Newell Williams, my other cabinet colleagues, my party officers, and particularly. I would like to acknowledge and welcome my colleagues from Tobago who are here with us tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, particularly members of the media who are here with us tonight, I want to recommit and to identify one of the founding pillars of the PNM when this party was formed in 1956. And that was the principle of morality in public affairs. <laughs> and just to let the population know that after all these years, the PNM still holds fast to the principle of morality in public affairs. From time to time, there may be human failings. But when that occurs, we hold on to the principle of morality in public affairs. And that is why I just want to point out to the population of Trinidad and Tobago tonight that the opposition leader is desperate and angry. And she's on a mission to try to prove to the country that all of us are the same. We are not. The PNM subscribes to, aspires to, and holds fast to the principle of morality in public affairs. Incidentally, today, May 24th, the day in 2010, this country changed its government. And the person who is now the opposition leader was welcomed into office, welcomed into office as the first female prime minister and the new prime minister of the people of Trinidad and Tobago, not of the UNC. However, Today, the opposition leader is desperate and angry because having got themselves voted out of office summarily in 2015 and accused of some of the most heinous actions, the opposition leader is fearful that the slow turning wheel of justice could stop and call their names. That's what she's panicking about. That is what the opposition leader is panicking about. So they engage in no discussion of policies or programs or reality for the country. Just personal attacks on members of the government for the singular purpose to be able to say that we are all the same so that when they hit a rock in their leaky ship, the spotlight that will focus on them, they will say all the way the same. We are not. The opposition leader knows that a significant number of her members and associates, 
not have not the allegations you know, have serious difficulty with the law in Trinidad and Tobago. They have one attorney general before the court. You on bail. He's a, he is the advisor while you're on bail. Another one close, also on bail. Police seriously talking to a number of them. So what they're trying to do is to give the impression, well, since they could not live out the fact that, you remember the story? Nothing happening, nothing happening. Two weeks ago, I think it was a high priced lawyer, a specialist investigator who was sworn in as a SRP in the police service in Trinidad and Tobago to pursue white collar crime, came to Trinidad and Tobago to continue her work with the police. And there was panic in the UNC camp. They'd gone on platform shouting the woman's name and accusing the government of spending money as if you could catch teeth without money. <laughs> Absolute panic. And we just said to them, the government of Trinidad and Tobago is committed to eradicating white-collar criminal conduct in the corridors of power in Trinidad and Tobago and will follow the evidence wherever it takes us. But I don't normally listen to the UNC diatribe on Sundays and Mondays. I just happen to be passing this morning in front of the radio and heard a rebroadcast. And it was the opposition leader saying about, and her words were, so many allegations against Faris. And it dawned on me that that was the major item of political activity for the last five or six years. Let me explain to the people of Trinidad and Tobago what is the foundation of that. The law in this country, the Integrity in Public Life Act spells it out in detail. And if you are in a position anywhere, not, even, not only the cabinet, but anywhere in public business, and any private business of yours or your close family or associates have business in front of that entity, you are required to declare your interests. And if you have such an interest, you then recuse yourself from the decision making that is taking place in your favor or your family favor, your wife or your children or your whatever it is. That is the law for all of us. So in the cabinet, every few weeks, the Minister of Finance invites the banks of the country to interact with the Ministry of Finance to provide funding in one way or the other. Borrow, pay, borrow, pay, but you have to go through a, a bidding process. And the banks make their offer, and the Ministry of Finance determine which offer they accept based on the price and so on and so on. That goes on every month in the Ministry of Finance. And that has to come to the cabinet at the end of the process for the cabinet approval. The Ministry of Finance can't just go off and borrow money just so. The cabinet has to approve it. When that comes to the cabinet, in the cabinet is a member, Stuart Young, whose brother works for a bank. Doesn't own the bank, but he works there. And every time that bank's name is called in one of these transactions at the Ministry of Finance, Stuart Young recuses himself from the decision. So if the Ministry of Finance went 10 times for the year and that bank was involved eight times, you will see on the eighth occasion, Stuart Young would have recused himself. I have a stamp. I stamp it on the, on, on the cabinet note and I indicate which minister. That's what the law asks for. Faris, on the other hand, is married into a family that has a lot of property in Port of Spain. And for years, those properties, many of them are rented by the government for all kinds of things and so on. Anytime any of those rentals come up for consideration, whether it's renewal or to establish a lease, 
Because he is in that family, he recuses himself. And in his own case, as a property owner himself, if his property comes up, it does the same thing. That is what the law asks you to do. But the UNC somehow managed and is managing to get the population to believe that complying in the, with the law is somehow an indication of wrongdoing on the part of these two gentlemen. And they run a whole election campaign on recusal. They, they know the exact number. My daughters got scholarships. The list of scholarships come to the cabinet. I'm in the cabinet. I had to say to the cabinet, these are my daughters. On different occasions, one then the other one. So you, 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 you indicate that you have an interest there. Later on, young Nian, Nian Gazbilali comes into the cabinet. Her daughter is on a scholarship list. She indicates that she has a, a conflict there. So others in the cabinet will know, and therefore you can't influence it in your favor. That's what the law calls for. But they're on platform talking about allegations against Faris because he, have, he recused himself. It is if he didn't recuse himself, then he would have been in breach of the law, and then he would have had a problem. So it was Faris, then it was Stuart, now it's Foster. So as I'm passing in front of the radio, she went straight from Faris to Foster. Foster must go. Foster must go. And the Prime Minister is accused of doing nothing. These are her words. The Prime Minister sidesteps the issues of firing these three people. The first issue was money deposited in an account. Money deposited into an account of a credit union. Okay, that's a fact. And of course, if money is deposited and the government watching agency sees money is deposited and want to know what is the meaning of this, they go and ask questions about it. That's the law. And since they raise it on platform with allegations of fact and calling for resignation, I asked the minister, what is this about? Bring me the evidence of your involvement here. And he does so, and he brings it to me, and I look at it, and I realize once again, Kamla Pasad Bissessa is making a horse's rend of herself. <laughs> Nothing for me to do. Then that didn't stick. Two years later, or it's again another one. He has three pieces of HTC land that he has grabbed. He said, let me, what is this about? Let me see. Comes, true, fact. Bought one from HTC, bought two from people who own HTC houses that, that belong to them. One plus two is three. He must, he must go. He must go because Kamala says so. Because she says so. But I simply want to tell you all the hypocrisy drips like green bile, you know. That is the same leader who was leader of the UNC. When the chairman of the Mayaro Corporation was charged, arrested and charged for bribery. What did she do? Charged, not allegation, you know. Whole night last night, if this is that and if this is that and if this is that, if you were an honest woman, you wouldn't be talking about you. If, 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 if. Well, if you don't know, then that's, just come down and shut up. <laughs> Everything is if. You have, you have scandalized the man's name, you have misled the country, and still talking about if. If means you don't know that it is so. And then demanding that I act based on your if. And accusing me of sidestepping. And what is worse? In Tobago we call it concourse. 
She is the big defender of Marlene, accusing me of um, abandoning Marlene after all that Marlene do for me and all, all, all the hard work Marlene did in the parliament. Mr. Kalmer Prasad Bissasa, stay the hell out of PLM business. <laughs> Marlene McDonald, my colleague, has been arrested and charged for a criminal matter. What is Kamla Prasad Bissessa saying? That that was my doing? An officer, a member of my party, is charged for a criminal matter and she's accusing me of abandoning Mali, the only person who I allow, apparently I was supposed to go and take away Mali from the police. Our support for Marlene is that she's innocent until proven guilty and she will get her day in court. What does that, how does that become a UNC matter? How? But let me tell you something. Eh? You all remember, you know, I was in the parliament a couple of days ago, a couple of sessions ago, and I heard Rudy Indar sing say that the, the NITCO, the state company, had lost the arbitration and that the government has to pay millions of dollars now to the contractor. Because they always are the contractor side. Eh? The other day, a contractor sued a state enterprise for $1.2 billion dollars payment certificates that they were claiming that they were owed and claiming 1.2 billion the matter went to court and the judge ruled that the contractor is owed 477 million dollars that 600 million of the 1.2 was not owed you know the UNC don't see that taxpayers save themselves 600 million dollars and the judge ruled that this money the contractor and elements of the company were seeking to take that money from taxpayers dishonestly through a conspiracy. The judge ruled that, you know, the judge ruled that the extra $600 million or $700 million was an attempt to get it through fraud. But the UNC's argument is the contractor win the case and the government had to pay $473 million. Well, I can tell them all tonight. That state company fought that matter and saved taxpayers $700 million. I've been telling you all for years that the UNC did something which I don't think any other government has done. After they awarded the contract to Point 14 and gave all of it to one contractor from Brazil, the contractor got into difficulty in Brazil, went bankrupt, and secondly, stopped the work in Trinidad. When we came into office, we met a series of people, contractors and others, who were owed money by the contractor who had stopped the job as a result of the bankruptcy in Brazil and whatever was going on. I told you then that when they awarded the contract, the contract documents had clauses in it that protected against that kind of eventuality. There was one clause, was clause 15.2e in the contract, which said that if the contractor is insolvent or goes bankrupt, the bonds that the contractor put up to bond the contract is callable by the state. In other words, the state can protect itself and recover the money because the contractor has gone bankrupt on, his, on the state's job. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you, they did something which allowed the contractor to go away with the bonds. And we came into government and met that, hot and warm. We went 
to court and argued with the court that this behavior of our government was not a reasonable action and what we are dealing with here is an attempt to defraud the state of a substantial amount of money. The court agreed and agreed in our favor that we should get the bonds and cash them and use the money on the project. That is how the point 14 highway is being built going on there. But I also told you that the contractor is not lying over and play dead. The contractor is going to go to arbitration. And we will only know our fate when the arbitration decision comes in. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the chickens have come home to roost. On the 31st of March, and I want you to pay attention to the dates, confirmed by the arbitrator in the arbitration, on the 31st of March 2015, OS was insolvent under the laws of Trinidad and Tobago and Brazil. Who was in government in this country on the 31st of March 2015? And the election was in September 2015. So here it is. The contractor, by public information, because all of us knew OAS went bankrupt for corruption in Brazil. March, the contractor goes bankrupt. March, so April, May, June, July, August, the UNC under Kamala Sushila, is it? Did absolutely nothing to protect the public money. But there's a clause in there that says, if the contractor is bankrupt, that money belongs to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They were not only content to do nothing. Let me read for you what the arbitrator has now said. Notwithstanding these matters, NIDCO was not at the date of his notice of termination entitled to terminate the contract under Clause 15.2. Remember I told you Clause 15.2 was where we were protected? The arbitrator is saying NITCO cannot defend itself under Clause 15.2 because it had waived such right by reason of the terms of the addendum to the contract which was entered into by the parties on the 4th of September, 2015. I ask you all to pay attention to the date. The 4th of September, 2015 was the last working day that Kamala Prasad Bissessa and the UNC were in the office as government of Trinidad and Tobago. That was a Friday. September 4, 2015 was a Friday. Saturday was the 5th. Sunday was the 6th. The election was on the 7th, the Monday, and they lost the election. But on the 4th of September, the UNC removed the clause by an addendum in that contract and allowed the contractor to go away with almost a billion dollars. Today, because of that situation, the court gave us the money. The arbitrator has taken it back. And we now owe the contractor 852 million US dollars. Sorry, TT dollars, TT. Sorry, 127 million US, which is 852 million TT dollars. That is the money that has now come round that circle. And that only could have occurred because the protection for the people's money was removed on the last day of the UNC being in office. They always want to know. They always have concerns. 
Tonight, I want you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, to ask Mrs. Kamla Passat Bissessa and her court of that thing they call the People's Partnership. Who removed this clause? We know why. We know why. But we don't know who. Calling on me to give you names of pedophiles? If ever there was ever a case to be made against an individual for misbehavior in public office, it is the person, it is the person who authorized the removal of that clause, which is now costing this country $852 million. So tonight, I call on the Commissioner of Police. I call on the Commissioner of Police tonight to go into NITCO and find out by what authority and under whose authority that clause was removed. I have been raising this matter for years and nobody in the UNC will ever respond whenever I raise it. Well, the matter has now come to this. They're calling people to come out and march because public servants can't get this and they can't get that. And everything in the country, every day they have some complaint about something. What can we do with $852 million? What can $852 million do for you anywhere in this country? But in the meantime, somebody in the UNC administration had the authority to, add, to put that addendum on that contract on the last day that they were in office. You know why? By that time, they realized that they had lost the election. They didn't do anything in March, April, May, June, because they expect to come back after the election and just continue allowing the bankrupt contractor to hold on to the money. But when they realize that it is possible for the government to change and there'll be a different government in office, they did that to allow the contractor to go away with $852,969,825. And then when that ruling comes in, because I was warning you, I say, until the arbitration is completed, we don't know what our position is. We got the permission to use the money for the last four years on the highway, but it was always clear that they will go to arbitration on the grounds that the clause was removed. Well, the arbitration, the arbitration has confirmed that now. We owe this money now. Unless, of course, we can successfully appeal it. But in the meantime, who is it who did that? Who did that? And why has Mrs. Kamala Prasad Bissessa and Sul Rambachan never respond to this? Why? Come another one called Jack Warner. Every week he publishes some of these papers. I ask for years in this country, what was the nature of the business that was conducted in South Africa between a minister of government of the UNC and the Brazilians who flew by private plane from Brazil to South Africa in a hotel in South Africa a few days before this contract was awarded. And all they do, they just don't answer. They just don't answer. Just turning up, mock every day and showing it at the window. Every day is some mock, straight up and show it at the window. Attack people. But let me tell you something. We are resilient people. I lead you and I know that you are resilient. They don't change their behavior, you know. You see all this nonsense that the minister was dealing with just now about pedophile and whatever? That's, what they have, that's where they have taken us. Look at what our national conversation is. Look at what it is. The leader of the opposition on platform and rebroadcasting it as though she do God's service, coming to talk that rubbish to the children of this country. But I'm not surprised. I tell her I ignore her. I, last, in the 2015 election, she got Ian Allen to go and get a woman and a girl and had a woman daughter. 
they made a video with the mother with her back facing the camera so nobody saw the woman's face and she was telling a story about me that I interfered with her daughter when she was a junior teen and the girl father beat me up and it was done in the presence of witnesses and the witnesses were Maurice Marshall who dead and Ken Valley who dead that is the modus operandi and she is on an audio telling Ian Allen when to publish it she wanted publish on Thursday night election Thursday night you had to publish it on Thursday night that is the woman who is today pretending that she has some concerns about morality in public affairs and therefore she wants Foster to go and Faris this and Stuart Young that. She makes me want to puke. I want the commissioner of police to go into NIDCO and the minister responsible for NIDCO is the minister of works and transport. He is hereby instructed to instruct NIDCO to cooperate with the police officers so the country so the country can determine under whose hand and under whose direction this travesty took place. You could imagine what we could do with $852 million that belong to us that they gave away for love and affection for love and affection of the contractor and coming now to tell me that the one called Wade Mark every Tuesday he has some nonsense to try to bust some mark the biggest mark in this country is just sit down alone exam you alone get a special exam you were scoring at 25% you have your special exam done to you, and you end up with 90%. Yeah. Tarnish the university forever and ever, amen. Yeah. You, know, you know, they really think we forget them, you know. These people really think we forget them, you know. But this is serious business. $852 million dollars. So, ladies and gentlemen, that being so, you heard Foster talk about the program that we have going on for young people. Just remember, all those items that he mentioned there, and all the young people who are going to be involved and benefiting there, that's additional expenditure on the budget. These are new programs, and these are additional people, and therefore, wherever we commit to those programs, whether it's building the structure, outfitting it, training, wherever it is. And it's not cheap. We have to find additional money to do that for these people. So the hundreds of young people who will pass through these programs, let it not be said, but nothing is being done for them. This is what is being done for them, and it costs millions of dollars. But they intend to put a spoke in every wheel that this government turned. Whether it's in foreign affairs, whether it is the Ministry of Finance, whether it is calling on the Americans to sanction the Prime Minister and, 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 and whoever else, they put a spoke in every wheel. So this program, this youth program that you so enthusiastically embrace tonight, they get a lawyer to write the minister. So as you know what to go and pay a lawyer to respond there, eh? because lawyers not cheap. Let me just quote for you one line in the lawyer letter coming from the UNC. And the, the, the letter is complaining about on behalf of people who illegally take hold of state land. You know the attack on Foster is about land grabbing? Well, this lawyer is writing the minister, Foster, on behalf of land grabbers. <laughs> and hear them. In these circumstances, these displaced farmers 
Nobody can displace you off your own land. The fact that you are being displaced is because you quite properly or improperly go and take up position on LSA land as if it was your own and prepare to fight for it. Right? Because that same Kamala Prasad business is on record telling them, go and squat wherever you want and we will find you. You all remember that? So these displaced farmers have to wonder why the LSA is evicting them. Well, nobody could evict you from your own land. But allowed, and listen to this, to assign lands to strangers to the agricultural sector. Tonight, I want to say to whoever write this letter that the people of Diego Martin, Karanaj, Aruka, Tunapuna, anywhere in this country, they are no strangers to any land in this country. And if they don't understand the history of this country, it is the ancestors of slaves who cut the forest and created the clearance in this country. There are people in this country who belong to that group of people whose ancestors met forests in St. In, in Joseph and cleared it all the way to create the fields in this country until sugar became a crop that died in 2004, I think it was, in this country. So who are you to say that if the government has a program to encourage young people into agriculture and some of them come from the East West Corridor that they are strangers and should be denied access to the land. No way! One of the problems we have in this country is that while we had generations of people who lived off the land, as the standard of living improved in the country, many people, younger people, young generation, moved into new jobs and the older people as they die off we have fewer and fewer farmers and the skills that are required to farm whether it is in crop or in livestock those skills are lost and we could talk till the cow come home unless we increase the number of farmers and get the new generation onto the land to farm we will not impact on our food import bill <laughs> so here it is that we made land available all around the country, go around the country and see who is on land all around the country farming. I distinctly recall that I was Minister of Agriculture when there was an IDB program, Agricultural Access Roads. And when I looked at the program, I was in the opposition then, when the program was looked at. And the position was that there is to be no expenditure in Paramin because Paramin doesn't have any agriculture and it's not an agricultural area. I had to fight that and they would not resist, they, they would not give up. When they gave up is when we came into government. I along with the MP for Diego Martin East at the time, we went to Paramin and got the program taken to Paramin. And that's why today there's a concrete road from lower Paramin all the way across the Shodo and Paramin has some of the more dedicated farmers in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> That road from Cameron to Shodo Hill, we built that road against the resistance from, of the UNC. Because as far as they're concerned, farmers are only those people who vote for them in the, the, the constituency where they live. We say all the people of Trinidad and Tobago ought to have access to all the resources. And if there are people in the East West Corridor or in Talparo or in Karen or wherever, as all we want of you is a genuine interest in agriculture, animal husbandry, or, or corporate production, and we will help you to do it. They come to tell me about our citizens are strangers. I say no more on that. But if they want that debate, I'm ready for it. With respect to the matters that Mr. Robinson Regis raised here tonight, I'm happy to hear and see that the opposition leader for the first time is going to file 
a vote of no confidence in me in my capacity as Prime Minister. I have the distinction of running this country for almost seven years and the leader of the opposition has never seen it fit to file a vote of no confidence in me or my government. But now she will. Now she will. Because I am supposed to have lied to the parliament. So you didn't find no vote of no confidence about any energy or planning and development or Tobago. No, no, no. You are only moved now on a matter of truth. Because I said that I have never seen and I don't know anything about a report by some Dr. Sabga. I would not be so crazy or so stupid to say that the UNC didn't pass five pieces of legislation in the parliament. Everything that goes on in parliament, if you sneeze sometimes, they put in brackets sneeze or stoops. That's what Hansard is. Hansard records everything that goes on in parliament. So how could I put God out my thoughts to say the UNC didn't pass some legislation? But that is their attempt to twist it by saying, well, you say we didn't do anything and we passed some legislation. Well, those children who were being brutalized at nights in their bed, tell them about the legislation that you pass. Tell them about that. Tell them about the police you didn't send to take the bully off the back. Because passing those legislation that couldn't be operationalized did absolutely nothing for those children in those homes who were being terrorized at nights. But you see, when people find themselves in that situation, they're usually not alone. You see this? This came out on the 15th of May, which is a few days ago. It is a report of an independent investigation of the Southern Baptist Convention Executive Committee. Those of you who have computer and access to, um, you can get it on your computer. Go and read this report. It's a report which is identical to our report here. Where children in the Southern Baptist community in the hands of the Southern Baptist leadership were sexually abused. And for 20 years, the Southern Baptist Committee hid this report. As a matter of fact, there was one gentleman, a fellow called Russell Moore. He was forever demanding that this report see the light of day and that action be taken and justice be brought for those children. They did all manner of evil to him. Accuse him of all kinds of things. But eventually today, this has come out. Go, when you go, and, go and look at what's going on at the Southern Baptist Convention now. Retribution now. And ringing of hands because they buried it for 20 years. This was buried in Trinidad and Tobago. Identical business for 24 years. You know why I got this? I was in Guyana last week. Before I went to Guyana, I called out the police to find this report and take action if there's any evidence in there to take action against anybody. When I came back from Ghana, somebody I don't know who dropped this off at my residence. This is the first time that I am seeing this report. The first time when I saw this report was last Sunday evening when I got back from Ghana. I am looking through it for the first time I haven't yet finished reading it. But then when the leader of the opposition, who was a prime minister for five years during the existence of this report, is going to file a vote of no confidence in me, because I say I have not seen this report, and the parliament has confirmed that this report was never laid in the parliament. And they saw bold face, even as the parliament has told the press and the press has reported that the report was never laid in Parliament, they are still saying so. 
for the benefit of public misinformation, they're still talking about we late and what we do and what we do. I expect that the police will go through this document. And if there are allegations in here supported by fact, and the perpetrators are still alive, well, they are still available for criminal prosecution. Still available for criminal prosecution. But senior counsel, self-appointed, when the, when, the, when the Express broke the story, dismissed it. That was 25 years ago. We're all going with that now. That was senior counsel. And I want to tell Mrs. Pasad Bissell tonight, don't waste your time on me. It is the Express that exposed this matter. It is the Express that got the facts and informed the people. It is a member of your cabinet, Verna St. Rose, who accused you all of cowardice and burying the report. That's where I first heard about it in that way. I heard Verna St. Rose talking on 995.5 about this situation. But she leaves Vona Centros to take on. She leaves the Express to take on and coming to pretend that she's coming to fight me with motion of no confidence in the parliament. Come on, look, look at yourself. Eh? But that is how they are. Try to mislead the public every time about everything. It doesn't matter how heinous the lies. They tell it to you. And when truth comes, they double down on the lie. And now they want to lead public servants to a place of milk and honey. After you give away $852 million, you're calling on unions to mobilize their membership to come and march. As if that somehow will give the Minister of Finance more resources. And there's a union leader saying what they're asking for is to be able to pay for the standard of living the way it used to be. But I'm not surprised that is a leadership talk, right? You don't have the business, the, 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 the work to do, and so does the government. Now, I took a little time to do some of the estimations because I don't want the population to be misled. I. I see some people in one of the newspapers making statements of facts encouraged by some of their leaders that we, the political directorate and the parliamentarians, we look after ourselves and take pay increase and don't want to give public servants a pay increase. For the benefit of the media who speaks to the public, let me tell you what the facts are. The last time MPs, and that includes ministers, got a pay increase was March 2014 from the November 2013 recommendation of the 98th report of the Salaries Review Commission. That's the last time anybody around the parliament or around the cabinet got any pay increase. And pay increases for members of parliament are not three year things where every three years they get something. It's open-ended. There's no limit. It could go for 10 or 15 years. So far it has gone. This year it would be the, what, the eighth year? This year would be the eighth year that that pay increase that we got then is still in force. And I could tell you, there's no report before the parliament now being considered for any increase for members of parliament. And I must also remind you that when I became prime minister of this country, at dealing with the economic calamity and the revenue losses that we faced, I made a public commitment to the country that there will be no pay increase for members of parliament until the economy has been turned around. And just about when we were coming to, a, to the, a position where we were within sight of balancing the budget and the economy was beginning to pick up, in comes COVID. Two years of beating. And what I said then stands now. 
there will be no pay increase for members of the executive of the cabinet or the members of parliament until the economy can deal with it. And that was the early position as regard members of parliament. So anybody you see talking about who took pay increase and who got pay increase, that is just foolishness and nonsense. And the very sad thing that I'm saying now to the unions in Trinidad and Tobago, I said up front to my colleagues in the cabinet and to my colleagues in the parliament. I'm consistent on this matter. So, circumstances beyond our control gave us some good, some good news. The Minister of Finance reported that because of the unusually high oil price and some improvement in the gas price, we are going to get a bit more money than we had budgeted for. And we immediately indicated that some of that money will go to public servants. We don't hide anything from this country, you know. We immediately said some of that money will go to public servants. So ladies and gentlemen, how much is it? Because you have to ask yourself, how much is it that we have that we now want to share with public servants? it might be approximately four billion dollars. That is the increase outside of what we had budgeted for. You would have seen, we went to parliament last week and added to the budget 3.1 billion dollars to be paid for from the four billion. We were, in, we were only able to do that because we got the four billion and all the things we said we were going to do, nobody in the parliament got up and said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. That 3.1 billion covered expenses that the government was carrying. And had we not got that increase, that unusual increase because of the Ukraine war, if we wanted to do those very sad things, we would have had to go and borrow another 3.1 billion. And since the budget had already got a deficit of 9.1 billion in it, if we had gone and borrowed that 3 billion that we appropriated last week, the budget for 2022 would have had a deficit of 12 billion dollars. 12,000 million dollars. Those are the realities of our circumstance. So while we say that we have got some improvement in our circumstances, when somebody comes up and asks for X percent, you have to determine now, is that affordable? Because we all know that what's happening in Ukraine could be temporary. More than likely, it is going to be temporary. Because the war in Ukraine has pushed out of the market the largest exporter of oil and probably the largest exporter of gas, one of the largest exporters of gas. It is the Ukraine war that pushed the Russian supply out of the market. If anything happens out there that caused that situation to change, then that pressure for the high price is gone and oil price will fall. That's simple logic. If tomorrow the Russians decide to stop the war, the pressure on the pushing up of the oil price will be relieved. If tomorrow the Saudis decide, well, okay, we've made enough money out of this special arrangement, we're going to pump more oil. If tomorrow the Venezuelans come back into the market, that's good. So we are in a very temporary situation driven solely because the Russian supplies have been pushed out of the market as a penalty for the Russian behavior at Ukraine. We have no control over that. So if we go and cut our cloth to suit these prices that exist today, 
When the turnaround comes, we may find ourselves with parts of our bodies exposed because the court was not properly cut. We have to give the public servants a reasonable offer because we don't need anybody to tell us. The pressure that the people in this country, like public servants and others, have been under, it is we who said that we will not go to the IMF. We will stay here in this country and prescribe our own medicine, giving us the opportunity. <laughs> giving us the opportunity to do what no IMF program will allow us to do. We have not laid off a single public servant who is gazetted as a public servant in this country. Because, because we have said, first objective, keep your job. Second objective, at the end of the month, have the money to pay you. And third objective, as soon as we are able to, we'll improve your earning capacity. That is the order in which the government has seen and has operated. If we find ourselves in a situation where we put number three in front of number one, then you know what happened there. Understood? We are saying the most important thing is to keep all the jobs in place. I know what it is like to be told by the Minister of Finance that at the end of the month we don't have enough money to pay public servants. I know that because we dealt with that. We can't put that in place as a permanent arrangement. I also know in the CARICOM, when I was working around the CARICOM, there was one particular CARICOM territory. Public servants were working for three, four months before they get any pay because there just wasn't enough money available to pay them. And there's one prime minister who tells me every morning he asks the accounts department how much money they collected yesterday to determine what they can spend today. You don't want to be in that situation. We've got a little breathing space now. I said, let us not overreact. Let us not get carried away. I see somebody in the editorial saying, that is not enough. I didn't say that was enough. That was my opener. You know, and the unions know, in negotiations, a position comes forward, and one is there. There's a high and there's a low. And the purpose of the negotiation is to come to somewhere in between where both sides can agree or that the negotiations can go no further. That's what it is. So look, let's, let's look at some numbers, people. For, let's say, the Minister of Finance offered through the CPO one plus one. There are two periods, right? One plus one. Let's, let's, let's tonight here, just double that and go two plus two. Right? That's 4%. That will cost a back pay of $1.45 billion if that's all that we do. And of course, an additional $730 million a year going forward. Because once you, once you change the pay, there's a permanent increase going forward. There's the back pay as one pay for the older period and for the new period going forward. The question is, is that sustainable? Having spent three billion of the four billion already, the war is grinding to a halt, or it is drag out for a little while longer, we don't know. Of the 4.2 billion, we spent 3.1 already. Let's say we have one left. The back pay at 4% would be 1.45 billion. You know what that means? We'll have to go and borrow $450 million to pay that back pay. The government may or may not do that. Let it work itself out. Let it work itself out. One thing I can give you, the assurance, people of Trinidad and Tobago, wherever you are, is that you have a government in office 
that is cognizant of your circumstances and is a responsible government and will give you the best relief that your country can afford. And let's get generous. Let's say we've got 8%. 4 plus 4. Sounds good? You might get a settlement on that. That will cost in back pay $3.6 billion. And an, annual, an additional annual cost of $1.4 billion. Do you see that money in the Treasury in Trinidad and Tobago at this time? Do you see the Minister of Finance in Trinidad and Tobago being able to find that money on a monthly basis to make sure that you with jobs get paid at the end of the month? But it might happen. Because when we came into government, when we came into government, after the others gave away the 800 and something million dollars, and the oil price was rocketing downwards to the bottom, we met a 14% back pay that cost us $6 billion. And we paid it. We borrowed the money and paid it. I want to ask a question. Are you the people of Trinidad and Tobago telling the government to do the same thing again? Tell me. I'm listening. Tell me. We could give an increase like that. But you must know that if we do that, we're going to have to go and borrow the money. And if we do that on this scale, in this way, and the oil price, gas price change, we are leaping in the dark. I see somebody saying how my statement to the unions is because I freed the march and um, workers are going to come out. Ladies and gentlemen, I have no such fear. What I have is confidence in the good sense of the good people of Trinidad and Tobago. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we have just passed the local government bill in the parliament. It was passed only with the votes of the PNM because the other people who had votes in the parliament refused to use their votes to bring about an attempt to modernize local government in this country. The other day I was hearing, I see Councillor Rondon here from Toko San Juan. They had an issue of the other day. Big bacchanal on the news, main item on the news. Toko San Juan Corporation can't cut the grass on the plain field so that the young people in Toko can't use the plain field because the grass is so high because there was no money to cut the grass. You also that use? And there's no money to fix a pothole here. If there's a flood in one of the corporations requiring a, a $500,000 to bring relief to people, the corporation has no money to do it. The corporation never has any money to do anything. Brings me to Gerard Furness Smith. I went into parliament in 1986, January, and I served with some distinguished parliamentarians. One of them was Gerald Furness Smith. And his position was that local government was a waste of time and was useless. And over time, if one is not careful, one can come to that conclusion. Because everything you want done in your district, in your street, in your neighborhood, you cannot call the corporation and say, please, this is my priority. Can you have it done? Because you get a guaranteed answer. We don't have any money here to do that. And I'm saying, this government intends to change that. <laughs> local government reform is meant to put better management structure in place in local government. 
It is meant to ask all the burgesses to pay a small amount per household, and that small amount paid by many, many people will put a cash flow in the hands of the corporation wherever they are, and that money will always be available on call on your account to do small things in your neighborhood. The quality of your life will change immediately. There are those who think that property tax is a make or break in this country's politics. This country has a party that went to a campaign in an election and told the country that you elect us to office, we will put property tax in place and we are going to use that money to improve local government, to improve the quality of your life, to improve this country. And we have a mandate. And we are taking steps to ensure that the property tax is collected and the word I want to use is hypothecate. I have a neighbor who loves that word. Hypothecate means that the revenue comes in and is designated for a particular purpose. So that hypothecation will take place, that, that money collected that you will pay. And you know who pays property tax? People who own property. I see one set of people who don't own a matchbox <laughs> objecting to property tax. Property tax is paid by people who own property, and because they own property, the tax is used to preserve the value of their property. If your street is not clean, if the grass is not cut, if there's no police service, if there's no fire service, if there's no health service, if there's no rat control, if there's no mosquito control, how much is your property worth? And the same people who are leading this charge, many of them have properties abroad. And they're always in the front to go and pay their property tax abroad as if that is a religion. But in Trinidad and Tobago, we, this, tax, this tax was waived for seven years. You have multimillionaires come telling you they need more time. No, it's not the time. Well, it would never be the right time, but the time for you to get your condition improved in your neighborhood and put something in place to improve the quality of your life in your neighborhood, that time is now. <laughs> and we have the PNM. We are accustomed to standing alone. How many times have we stood in the breach alone? When we were to form the unit trust in this country, we stood alone. When we brought in PAYE in this country, we stood alone. When we brought free secondary education in this country, we stood alone. When we built the Mount Hope Hospital, we stood alone. When we created UTT, we stood alone. So don't be afraid. The PNM standing alone is par for the course in Trinidad and Tobago. So having built Point Lisas, when a manifesto of the others said that we had got involved in sunset industries and we should never have done that and we'll never do it again today. I'm talking to the United States government on a regular basis, at all levels, and I'm telling them that Trinidad and Tobago is an international participant at international level in methanol, urea, and ammonia, and LNG. That's us, PNM Sudaloon. PNM Sudaloon. So we are going to go ahead, now that the bill has gone to the Senate, we expect that it will pass in the Senate, and when it is passed in the Senate, then we will sit down and work out the structures that the law requires, and we'll do it in a systematic way to make sure that it has a chance of success, and local government will move from just being local government election to being local government as a practice for the improvement in the quality of your life.
and as for allegations of corruption in my government, seven years, seven years, they cannot point to a single minister who has a single difficulty about a single action that took place under my government. And just to make it very clear, Marlene's difficulty is for something that happened under the two governments before me. In the Manning administration, the UNC was there after me, and then I came in here leading this team. Nobody in this government is afraid of police or blue light, as I tell them before. And I tell my colleagues here, you could make mistakes. You could make mistakes. I expect you to make mistakes or not be as ready as you should be. I have your back. But on matters of honesty and integrity, if you fall short, you're on your own. <laughs> having said that, having said that, Forza should go because they don't like the fact that he has three pieces of land. They're shocked at the fact that he was in business handling a couple billion dollars. And of course, they are shocked that the Rowley family bought an apartment in Tobago for $1.2 million. I am now the subject of the Integrity Commission investigation. Maybe I should go too. But I could tell you, I could tell you one thing. When you are accustomed to thiefing, anybody you see with a bag, you figure they teach something. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of Arima, I'm always so happy to be here with you. And you have been a bulwark in this country, and you've been a patient people. Very soon, you will get to walk in and out of your brand new hospital the way it was designed. And you will continue in the PLM to provide leadership in this community. And we of the PNM will provide the leadership, making the changes for the better that this country deserves. And when we do that, we will shout, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, great is the PNM, and we shall prevail. Somebody touch me. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's one lesson you learned tonight is that when lies and dishonesty connect people together, the truth will eventually separate them. And that is why the PNM stands miles apart from any other political organization in Trinidad and Tobago. And that is why we have as our political leader and as our Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Keith Christopher Rowley. And so we thank all of our speakers tonight. We thank our Lady Vice Chairman for providing us with the full name, and that's what we really should be doing. Anytime you hear it, say, Shoo Kamala, Shoo Shala, from now on. And so we thank our speakers, our, our host MP, Honorable Penelope Beckles Robinson, Honorable Foster Cummings. We thank all of those who helped to make this meeting the tremendous success, the Operations Committee, the Mayor and his team. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been a fantastic audience. The PNM Tobago Council invites you to its Thanksgiving service under the theme Rekindling the Fire on Sunday the 29th of May from 4 p.m. at the Signal Hill Secondary School, and so you are all invited to attend that event. And ladies and gentlemen, as we leave, we remember that we currently have an attack by the most disloyal opposition ever, and we in the PNM must reject them. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Get home safely. Great is the PNM.
touch me, somebody touch me, somebody touch my soul. 